Hello, everyone, and welcome to On the Safe Side, a monthly podcast hosted by the editors of Safety and Health Magazine, the official magazine of the National Safety Council. This is Kevin Drewley, Associate Editor at Safety and Health, and with me, as always, are my fellow Associate Editors, Alan Ferguson and Barry Botino. Hello, guys. Hello. Hey, Kevin. Thank you all for joining us for the 50th episode in our podcast history. Yes, 50. Half a hundred. It's the roundest number for On the Safe Side yet, and really it's one we're quite proud of. So please stick around for a retrospective at the end of this, well, very special episode. I wish I had the musical accompaniment for that phrase. Many of you have had a unique journey into the safety profession, and we want to hear about it for our My Story feature in our magazine. Submit your personal stories about how you got into the safety field by emailing us at safehealth at nsc.org. To view past My Story entries and catch up on all the news from around the safety world, visit our website, safetyandhealthmagazine.com. In this month's podcast, we'll recap some key stories and highlights from the pages of our April edition of Safety and Health Magazine in our In This Issue segment. We'll also be joined by Safe Start Senior Safety Consultant and friend of the podcast, Tim Page Bodorf, for our Five Questions With interview. There, we'll discuss approaches to safety that include Safety 1 and Safety 2, which often are viewed as the, quote, old safety versus the new safety. And that talk will be part of Tim previewing a co-presentation he'll be giving at the upcoming Spring NSC Safety Conference and Expo in Rosemont, Illinois, not far from where we're recording in Itasca, Illinois. And also, we'll get you up to speed on news from around the safety world in our In Case You Missed It segment. Is everybody ready for lap 50? Here we go. It's a new month and a new issue of Safety and Health, which gives us plenty to talk to you about. The April issue features our annual Safety and Health training survey. We encourage you all to take just a few minutes and share your thoughts about training in your organization, including whether your budget has increased or decreased, what types of training and methods you use, in addition to who you train each year. Uh, We also want to know about what lessons you've learned from conducting safety training and pitfalls that others can learn from. Alan's feature story on remote work focuses on how COVID-19 changes just how many of us work away from our pre-COVID work addresses. What policies and procedures should you have in place to address the growing number of remote workers? Alan has you covered. He also shares what OSHA says about the issue and discusses why emergency procedures are necessary. My story on work zone safety examines trends that are, quote, going in the wrong direction, unquote, and are impacting the lives of workers along with drivers and their passengers. April marks National Work Zone Awareness Week, which is scheduled for April 15th to 19th. And the theme this year is work zones are temporary, actions behind the wheel can last forever. This important observance at the start of the annual construction season in many states can help both workers and drivers understand how safety in and around work zones can keep everyone safer. Find the coverage in your mailbox or online at safetyandhealthmagazine.com. Every safety professional has a unique story, so what's yours? Safety and Health Magazine wants to hear about your path into the occupational health and safety field for a My Story column. You can share your safety origin story by sending a submission to safehealth at nsc.org. Change is an ever-present part of this world, and over time, the safety world has changed from safety one to safety two. We look at what defines those terms, among other topics, with our guest, Safe Start Senior Safety Consultant Tim Page Bodorf. Tim will join Corey Pitzer for a presentation titled The Battle Between Safety 1 and Safety 2, Who is Right and Who is Wrong, on May 15th during the Spring NSC Safety Conference and Expo in Rosemont, Illinois. To learn all about the conference, visit our website at ssce.nsc.org. That's SSCE for Spring Safety Conference Expo.nsc.org. And Tim, thank you so much for joining us once again on this podcast. Well, thank you so much for having me. I appreciate you guys, and uh, it's my honor. It's definitely my honor to be here. Uh, First question, are safety one and safety two well-known in the workplace, and do you think the definitions and elements of each are understood? Uh, Great question. I'm going to tell you, just from my personal experience in doing research, um, half the people that I get a chance to work with, uh, they know about it, and the other half, they don't. They're just trying to survive. And so educating them on the process is what's important to understand where they're trying to go. And so defining the elements 
I think is the best place to start with a lot of folks who just the if the ones that barely know what's going on or the ones that actually don't know what's going on, defining those terms right up front is really good. And I will suggest that if anyone out there is trying to figure out where they are, one of the best things you can do is start off with the good old fashioned assessment. Where am I? And what it'll do, and it's a safety two term, is it'll help you define context. And so where you are and where you want to go are two different things. And they can be defined by desired outcomes and they can be defined by doing a complete assessment. But defining the terms, I, I think that a, a lot of people are trying to figure out where they are. And so I think that's the helpful part to just begin with is just start understanding where you are. And so in defining, I'll tell you right up front, Eric Holnagel, professor, doctor, author, um, an incredible advocate for the world of safety, and in other words, no injuries, um, has defined both terms on his own. And in doing so, you've got a lot of marketing associations, a lot of marketing organizations, a lot of teams, a lot of safety consulting teams that are out there trying to market their their organization and trying to figure out what's best for a customer. And so sometimes in that marketing in, uh, adventure, you're going to get folks talking badly about one versus the other. And unfortunately, if you get those types of marketing elements out there, that's negative pitting one team against the other, you're going to get the battle. And I want to just define right up front, we're actually not trying to battle. There are tools in both camps that are going to be helpful. And so Holdnagel actually came back to the drawing board and said, hey, hold on, time out. There are things that people can do in both of these elements. And so one is not better than the other. And I know the three of you would... <laughs> You would definitely understand this. There's not one ring to rule them all in safety. It's try to use the tools that are out there that are available to you based on the context, which is a hop term or a safety two term. And if you understand the context of where you are, where you're going, that just goes back to saying you got to start with trying to identify where you are and where you want to be. And so you could take tools from either one of those camps. And so just going to say it up front. Try not to pit one against the other, and that'll help us. Uh, that'll help us on the stage um, at the NSC Spring Event in Chicago. But thank you for the question; it's always good to ask. Tim, you mentioned personal experience, and we wanted to talk to you about your evolution with these two approaches, and how have they spanned your career, and and where are you at in this journey? Uh, Barry, thank you for that. That is a great question, and you know what? I think the three of you understand that I started off in the Marine Corps, so there was a lot of command and control. And so it was either compliance or not. And so my evolution started off very heavily in safety one, um, as it was coined by Eric Holnagel. And Holnagel's definition, my experience has always been safety by design was always getting the reward of having zero or low injury rates. And so we would profess that that would be an opportunity. And that definition can get very academic. But in my experience, when you reach zero, a lot of organizations start to celebrate. They throw their hands up in there and they say, hey, woohoo, we got zero injuries. So that would be a good term for a lot of folks, in my experience, for safety one. Whereas in safety two, a lot of the times you see a lot of folks out there, they're 99% of the time they're actually doing really good. And what you'll end up getting is a lot of folks complaining because of the one mistake. And so I find in, in my experience that it's easier to focus on the mistake, place some blame. And unfortunately, there is another word that rhymes with blame that start to, starts to enter that equation, and that's shame. And so you'll see a lot of folks get some shame and blame and judgment. And so you'll, you'll start talking about behavior. And where safety two starts to talk about and the evolution of it was that you didn't really focus on the 99% of the times that they actually did something good. And that's, to me, providing gratitude, thanks, and appreciation is an opportunity for success. Um, and I will throw out another name, Dr. Amy Edmondson, who's pretty much defined psychological safety. She actually says that the high-performing teams are the ones that are willing to admit that they made mistakes in the past and what they're going to do to move forward. And so, as again, my experience is in this evolution of safety one and two, if you're willing to define the mistakes that you've made, both as an organization and as an individual, you can move forward from those mistakes, but that's not defined in one or two. It's really just saying, well, here's where we were, here's where we wanna go. And again, 
context defines everything. And so without getting academic, I, I appreciate the question about experience, but if you're willing to improve and you're willing to use old Deming's calculation for, you know, plan, do, check, act, if that is in your blood or DNA, it doesn't matter which route you go. You're always willing to improve. That means you're going to make the necessary adjustments as you progress. So the evolution of one, the evolution of two, or basically just the evolution of safety period is if you're real, if you're just willing to improve, my experience suggests that you're going to actually make those improvements because it's desired. Some people, you know, organizations will get complacent and that's called organizational complacency. They don't build any resilience into their planning. And so they're just happy with where they are. For me, that's not good. And th that can be defined in both one and two. So like I said before, if you want to take tools from either one of these, all I'm asking you is if you're willing to improve and you've got something that you've identified to improve, my experience suggests that you're going to actually make great steps moving forward. Tim, can safety professionals get stuck in between these two approaches, safety one and safety two? Have you guys seen LinkedIn lately? <laughs> I, I, I did my uh, graduate research on social media distaste or social media discourse in the world of safety. And unfortunately, I found that my in my research that a majority of times that I saw arguments or discourse, it wasn't civil. It was because of these two terms. And... Unfortunately, I, I know Eric Holnagel came back and said, hey, take a look at these two. These, they're two different camps, but unfortunately, he also admitted that when he coined the definition of one and two, it was more of a versus instead of an and. And so he's trying to come back and let everybody know that, that yeah, there's probably pros and cons for both. But you'll find that a lot of safety professionals get stuck in the middle. And so to your question, I feel... Sometimes if they get stuck in the middle, they're going to lean towards what's popular. And so right now, and you can see it on LinkedIn, there's a lot of safety too, resilience engineering, HOP. There's even conferences now that actually focus just on human and organizational performance. And, you know, that's okay because it's got great tools. But what you'll end up finding is that since it's popular and since people get stuck in the middle of the two, they actually tend to lean to what's more popular because it's what's people talk that that's what they're talking about and so they can't forget that they still have to maintain compliance which unfortunately gets coined in the silo of safety one you can't forget that some people make mistakes and of course if you're building resilience as a safety two term you'll actually allow them to fail safely in other words you're actually building a system so that they can if they do fail and an hop term for safety two is that human error is normal well, if you're building it in, which is fine, you can do that. I hope you would. You'll develop a system to allow that to happen. And so to get stuck in the middle, people actually have a tendency to lean towards what's popular. And I just want to remind everybody that, yes, you can do that. And what's popular right now is safety two and resilience engineering and HOP. But don't forget, you still have to maintain compliance. And in order for you to do that, you've got to pull some tools from safety one because, well, a whole Nagel even said it that's where the success is because you study success on zero injuries or lower injuries. And, and at the same time, if you get stuck in the middle, don't forget, you can still focus on the folks that are actually doing things that are right. So doing both is what's helpful. Taking tools from both is what's helpful. And I'm not going to create a new term, which in some cases, a lot of folks have already done that safety three. And I'm not, I'm not here for that. I'm here for saying safety is safety. And so and you can do that. If you get stuck in the middle, there are third party people out there that can help you. If you want to lean towards the popularity, that's fine. Just make sure you don't forget your roots. You still have to maintain compliance. Uh, judging for your comments, I'm, I'm guessing safety one and safety two, it's not an either or. It, it is possible to combine aspects of both and, and kind of how do you do that? Or, um... Well, first of all, it's a great question. And I did a LinkedIn post about six months ago saying that it's never down to either or. It's always an and. And so in, in air quotes, I'm going to say the word and. There are elements that you could use from both. And I'm going to tell you right now, if you got some folks that are telling you, no, it's this way, I'm going to go always go back to the Lord of the Rings. There's never one ring to rule them all. And if there is one ring to rule them all, it needs to go back into the fires of Mordor. 
I, I would suggest that if you're going to move forward, you have to figure out how the Shire and the elves and the dwarves can come together. And so I hope everybody understands that analogy. And if you don't, it's just that you've got diversity all over the board. And I know DE and I is an equation right now for a lot of safety professionals. But if you want diversity, you're going to look at all sets of tools and not just one. That's not diverse. That's really just exclusion. And so if you're going to be exclusive in your activities and you're going to be exclusive in your approach, you're going to actually close the door to any other thoughts. And so a lot of folks are geared towards, you know, the way they think. And some people are very passionate by the way they think. Um, again, you can look at social media and look at folks that are actually posting videos and pictures and things about safety failures. And unfortunately, what you'll get in the comments is a lot of shame and judgment. And so I, I try to steer away from that saying, hey, instead of equaling towards shame or trying to venture towards the shame path, look at, at, at empathy. Was there ambiguity in the very beginning? And we could tackle all of that with this question about either or. It's not about or. It's more along the lines of what can we do in between both of these? And, you know, I'm going to go back to an earlier term that, that you used in the question. It's not about getting stuck in the middle. It's actually seeing from the points of, of each view. I want to see where I'm at. And if you are in the middle, I'm not going to say stay stuck there. I'm going to say, hey, look at what you could look on the left. Look at what, what could you do on the right? A union between the two is more important than a spectrum of the two. And so either or is not in my vocabulary in regards to these two camps or silos. It's actually going to be what can I do from both or is there an and in the equation? Well, Tim, we appreciate that explanation and we're glad to know that there will not be a battle between you and Corey on stage. So we're very happy to hear that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Thank you for that, Barry. I wanted to ask you, um, if folks listening to our podcast, if safety pros out there, aren't sure what fits for them or what's right for them. What advice would you have about looking at both and trying to know where they are? That's a great question. And if you wouldn't mind, I'd like to talk about how I would approach it first and then maybe recommend a couple of different approaches. Um, it just happened yesterday. I was at the Southwest Safety Congress for the NSC and the Arizona chapter. And somebody had asked me, I'm kind of stuck in where I need to go with this because we're having a communication challenge. And then I was like, oh, well, we'll talk about that first and then tell me what's going on. Well, the employees don't trust supervisors and leaders, and so they don't speak up when it's time or they don't stop work, even though the authority has been given them. And I said, well, hold, that's a lot of context. And I said, let me ask, would you be willing to have me come on site so I could see what the culture is, any potential climate barriers? And then I, I often refer to this as a human factors management review, and it's how we start with a lot of our customers with Safe Start. Is that just we want context, a full circle to the very first question. If you don't understand where you are, um, so what I always ask is, is that can I come on site or can I visit with your leadership team? Um, and in doing so, after I visit with the leadership team, can I actually start with the safety committee or the employee led committees? I'd like to get context from both sides of the story here. And come to find out through context conversations there, there was, a, there was a distrust because employees had fear. And the fear was, was three-pronged. One, a lot of employees said that they don't talk about things anymore because they don't think that supervisors would do anything about it in the first place. And so in interviews, you find out that some employees were just, and this just happened over a period of just 24 hours, Employees just didn't want to talk about it because they tried before, but then supervisors didn't act. So there's one step. Number two, there's fear of punishment or reprisal or some kind of uh, repercussion. And I'm going to tell you right now, if that's in the context, there's actually a law that prohibits retaliation. And so a lot of employees that just right now, the fever at this company or the climate at this company was they didn't want to speak up because there was fear of re, uh, repercussions and they didn't want to lose their jobs. That's huge. That's a big deal. So that's going to actually provide a large gap of communication. And then the third was is that the employees didn't feel like they actually had the authority. And unfortunately, if the employees didn't feel that way, there was no management leadership implementation approach. Or if they did try the implementation and we're talking about three major gaps that you would have never gotten unless you asked. So at the very beginning, 
and it, it's great that you asked this question now because full circle, if you don't understand what you're going to do or what you or where you are, you have no idea which tools to pull from these two silos. So therefore, you start to stab at what's cool and what's popular and what everybody else is doing. And unfortunately, what everybody else is doing may not fit for what you need. And in this case, great question. What would I do? What should most companies do? If you don't have a full grasp on what's going on right now, and if you weren't able to define just those three simple gaps, and I'm going to say simple now because they're very complex, but in the very beginning, it's simple to gain by asking just a few questions. And if I can close on this note, what approach is right for them? Using both camps, all you got to do, which is, by the way, a federal law in Australia, is just ask, are you okay? Are there tools that you need? Am I doing a good enough job? Did you get the level of communication that you needed? And so it all starts with trust, communication, and basically the will or the desire to improve. And so I, I would say that's where you should start. Um, and most organizations that are out there, what approach is right for you? There isn't a right or wrong. There isn't an either or or. It's gonna come back to which approach should you use based on the context based on where you want to be your desired outcomes and do you want to improve? And so on that note, I would just say, if you're willing to improve, that's the best place to start. It doesn't matter what silo you attract from or what you pull from. All I would just, just suggest is that if that is the case, then take the next step and really find out where you are and where you want to be. Thank you so much, Tim, for this fantastic conversation. We appreciate you joining us here on the safe side. Thanks for having me and you guys. I appreciate you and I hope to see you in Chicago in a couple months. Long before the time of podcasts, and even before the Occupational Safety and Health Act of 1970, William Shakespeare professed, quote, April hath put a spirit of youth in everything, unquote. For that reason, it's understandable that surfing safetyandhealthmagazine.com for safety news and developments might not seem as appealing this time of year as, say, feeling the sunlight or looking and listening to nature. Lucky for our listeners, we're here with the In Case You Missed It segment, which aims to shine a light on news that might have slipped through the cracks for whatever reason. To get things started, just wanted to talk about a recent study that highlights the expected ties between exposure to cancer-causing, I'll just call them PFAS, you can, we, we can read about how to pronounce them too, but it's, it's something that you should be familiar with through, with magazine coverage. They're the, commonly called the forever chemicals, just given to how long they can stay in our bodies. Um, the, the study is transferable certainly to workers, because I'll, I'll get to the, the findings of this particular study in a minute, but Recent research last year was a research review by NIOSH reports that exposure to these forever chemicals really is common across occupations. Um, workers certainly involved in, in the chemical manufacturing that is based around these chemicals have the highest exposure levels, but NIOSH also has found that folks who work in textile mills and uh, metal plating um, facilities, as well as offices and also those who are fishers and barbers, those are some of the leading industries with um, with the, that exposure. So this study was out of China and just had found again that, that a, a wide array of U.S. adults who were exposed to these chemicals um, were at a higher risk of a condition that's called hyperlipidemia. And that is something that refers to high cholesterol and other dysregulated lipid levels and is associated with an increased risk of heart disease. So again, we seem to, to semi-often get new research on our desk about these forever chemicals, but this is just something else that's spotlighting the, the dangers of these exposures. Barry, how about you? Well, in the theme of In Case You Missed It, uh, Kevin, I missed your first 49 mentions of Shakespeare in the podcast, so I'm glad you uh, waited till number 50 to give us a, a Shakespeare reference. Thank you for that. Absolutely. I, I give a cap tip to, to Google. <laughs> Well, I wanted to talk about a, a study that came out of the University of Wisconsin Parkside, and um, the, the study surrounds basically um, a, a group of researchers looking at states where recreational marijuana sales are legal. And what this group found was that they've seen nearly a 10% increase in on-the-job injuries among younger workers in these states in recent years. And the group we're talking about is workers who are 24, 20 to 34 years old. Um, and it's a very interesting study. And, and they also found that the injury rate per 100 workers 
rose 8.4% in those states as well. And now by contrast, there was no link at all between workplace injuries and marijuana use um, in states that don't permit the sale for recreational use. So a very interesting study there out of the University of Wisconsin Parkside, and you can find that uh, online on our website, safetyandhealthmagazine.com. Alan, tell us uh, what your In Case You Missed It item is this month. Uh, OSHA and the Mine Safety and Health Administration recently announced their series of events um, in honor of Workers Memorial Day, which takes place every year on April 28th. So these events will begin on April 22nd at about 8.45 Eastern Time is OSHA's Virtual Awareness Conference. And there's a, also a Workers Memorial Expo set for 9 a.m. to 4 p.m. Eastern on April 24th at the Francis Perkins Building in Washington, D.C. And on April 25th, OSHA and MSHA staff will gather in the same building to honor fallen workers with a ceremony and a wreath-laying event, which can be viewed via Zoom from 1 to 2.15 p.m. Eastern. And, and to learn more about the events and, and register, you can go to www.osha.gov slash workers dash memorial. Now it's our listener's turn. Is there something important you've learned recently and want others in the safety world to know? Please email us your thoughts and feedback to safehealth at nsc.org. We're eager to hear from you. Thank you everyone for joining us for this month's episode, which as Kevin said, is a very special episode of On the Safe Side. We know that your time is valuable and we appreciate you spending some time with us. We encourage you to visit safetyandhealthmagazine.com slash podcasts to check out each of our past episodes. We'd also appreciate you rating, reviewing, or spreading the word about our podcast. To find stories, news, and insights from around the safety world, you can also check out our website, safetyandhealthmagazine.com. And make sure you follow us on your favorite social media channel. As we wrap up this episode, we wanted to share some best memories of the past 50 episodes. And for me, I go back to episode two, when we spoke to our guest this month, Tim Page Bodorf, for the very first time. In that episode, back in April of 2020, that was our first one at home during the COVID-19 pandemic. I came back to the office where I'm based five days a week in August of 2021. So for 17 months, we recorded from our homes amid the passing garbage trucks in my neighborhood on Wednesdays, landscaping crews buzzing around the neighborhood, that's on Fridays, and planes rumbling overhead coming into O'Hare Airport. It was truly a unique time. And Kevin, I know you probably have a favorite memory as well of the last 50 episodes. No, there are quite a few, and just your your mentioning just kind of the uniqueness makes me recall we've had a few pivots in our living situations from renting to living with a father-in-law after a family situation now to, to owning a home. So, no, the, which each situation comes a different um, different challenge, but, no, we've certainly met that. Um, the episode, though, that you do reference, episode two, recalls a question to Tim in you heard him talk about Lord of the Rings, so certainly it shouldn't be surprising that he drew parallels to baseball and music. But in that interview, he already had talked about those. So our last question to him led to him remarkably dissecting just what really would be a, a basic question among baseball fans, and that's what song would you be your walk-up music if you were called up to the plate. So Tim ultimately settled on, as I recall, Uptown Funk by Bruno Mars featuring Mark Ronson. But again, he led us through his thought process of how it would have been different as a teen versus as an adult. And he just said he's really grew to, to learn and, and appreciate music beyond just the heavy guitar riffs of ACDC. I think he said that if you'd asked him years ago when he was first playing ball, it would have been uh, back in black, I believe. Um, the aforementioned exit question in those days, though, was called the pop quiz, and it typically incorporated elements of the interviewee's outside interests or personality. Then and now, it really felt like a fitting approach because of our shared past as recovering sports writers. I know for as strongly as we commit to bringing to each of these episodes the professionalism that discussing worker safety deserves, it's also been important to make you smile a little, as we say, upon closing each episode. Uh, I guess on the safer side, sorry, or a, most, a more serious side anyway, a memorable episode is number 32 from October 2022. And that one we explore a couple of topics that really aren't going away, and that's reducing the stigma around addressing worker mental health, as well as the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on safety training. 
the discussions were thought provoking as usual and really just showed great versatility that's worth calling out now. Alan, how about you? What are some of your standout memories from past episodes? So I have a, a couple of favorite memories. Number one was the patience of Paul McNeil, our guest in episode three, as we try to figure out what went wrong with our old virtual meeting uh, slash recording program. I think we spent a good 20 to 25 minutes trying to troubleshoot. Uh, and I remember getting so red and flushed uh, in, in the face from just ner pure nervousness. And Paul couldn't have been nicer. He, he gave us a lot of great information about what to do, quote unquote, when OSHA comes knocking, as was the title of the episode. And a number, another memory is learning once again the firsthand difference between reading a term and pronouncing it. And this term, and I'll try to do this on one take without messing it up, is respirable crystalline silica. For so many years, I well read done, that Alan. in my well head. As <laughs> I read it in my head for so many years as respirable crystalline silica. I know it seems like a subtle difference. But I think we pride ourselves on our accuracy as a publication and as a multi-prong media entity. Uh, we I don't know how many minutes we spent on trying to nail that pronunciation. I would say at least 15 to 20 minutes, and I would make even longer. It seemed like it was forever, but it was all in the name of accuracy. Well, you're right, Alan. We did spend a little time listening to some YouTube videos trying to find just, just the right <laughs> pronunciation of that phrase. But, Alan, I wanted to, to take our listeners back. Uh, we need to thank you for heroically saving a podcast episode, one of our live episodes, uh, from almost not happening out in San Diego. Can you share that story? Sure, yeah. So it was it, it was an honest mix-up on time zones. Um, I this has involved uh, our interview, our live interview with Doug OSHA leader, Doug Parker. And obviously they're coming from Eastern time zone to, to Pacific time zone. We're coming from central time zone. So it's, you know, there's a, a lot of different time zones involved there when you go out West and or a lot of a time change there when you go out West. And so um, I th think there was a, just a, again, an honest mix up and we kept, we were waiting. It was like five minutes past. I felt like it was 10 minutes past. I, and, you know, we had a, a, an audience there and kind of looking up at us and, and I'm like, okay, where, you know, where's Doug? Uh, where's Mr. Parker? Um, and no one kind of knew where he was and come to find out that he was uh, wandering the, or just looking around the show floor. And I happened just to look out from where we were sitting on these, these high top chairs um, and I looked through this plexiglass that we had in the NSC booth and I just see his face wander by. And I, I don't know how, what level, of, I felt like it was very nonchalant and I just kind of said, there he is. <laughs> 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 and then I didn't, I, again, it, I just kind of, uh, like nonchalant reacted, but, but our editor, Melissa Ruminski and Kevin, I feel like you guys jumped up and you just, you intercepted him before he even got past our booth. We did. As, <laughs> you know, as, as safely as one can do something so urgently. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. You, you guys did not run. You, you walked briskly. <laughs> right. For the purpose. Yeah. <laughs> yeah and, and safely and, and, and intercepted him and, you know, got him to do, I, what I thought was a, a fantastic interview. So, you know, it's one of those Absolutely. things, it was a lot of nervousness at first. We just, I just happened to get lucky that I was looking in the right place. And, you know, and again, you and Melissa reacted so quickly that I didn't even, you know, before I could even react um, and got him over here. So um, that was, yeah, that was a, a, a pretty funny moment looking back in hindsight. Yeah, great story that we'll talk about for a long time yeah. here for sure. So, and the crowd stuck around too. They, they did, yeah. They did, yeah. They did, and, and Doug was great. So, yeah, he was fantastic. As, as you said, Alan, he was really good. So, well, despite the many unique happenings over the past fifty episodes, there has been one constant. The original music for this podcast was composed by our friend Steve Maslin. Thank you so much, Steve, and a big thank you to all of our NSC colleagues behind the scenes who make all 50 of these podcast episodes go and hopefully 50 more we'll be back next month to have more safety related discussions talk to trusted voices from around the profession and hopefully make you smile a little in the meantime please stay on the safe side